Hi everyone, welcome to the uh, Firefish Software Future of Rec Crowdcast. My name is Cameron McLennan. Um, today I'm very, very fortunate, fortunate and lucky to be joined by uh, Greg Savage and Chris Savage. Just before we kick things off, gents, can you tell um, the audience a little bit about yourselves, please? We'll start off with Chris. Good. Well, I was born at an early age. You never ask people to actually give their own background because they take it out. Uh, but very simply, firstly, thanks for having me with you to, um, um, on, on this uh, webcast. Um, my background is a 35-year career in professional services. Now, most of that has been in the advertising, digital, PR, branding and design, the communications industry. But through my work in the communications industry and with a whole range of professional services companies, in my roles as, as leading PR firms across Asia Pacific, in owning agencies, is in running the biggest listed um, marketing content and communications business in the Southern Hemisphere, now recently merged with a group called WPP, I be, have become obsessed with how to stay at the edge of professional services. That's my passion, whether you're in recruitment or investment banking or advertising or digital, how do you stay at the edge to stay relevant longer through turbulent change? So I have a world of experience in professional services, and I'm looking forward to sharing some of my ideas and tips uh, that Greg and I have, have put together for today. Brilliant. And yourself, Greg? First of all, I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to do this web with my father, Chris. Nice to see you here, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have coming up for 40 years in recruitment, so I'll give you the very, very short uh, um, highlights. I guess uh, one of the biggest highlights was starting a company with three other guys called Recruitment Solutions, and 12 years later, we built that to 250 people and about 10 offices, and we were listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, which was a very exciting journey and, and a lot of learning. I had another 10 years with a company called Aquint, where I was their international CEO, and that was a global kind of role. Um, well, very global. We actually ended up with uh, 35 offices in 15 countries, so um, and we started with five. So that was a great journey. Um, we were, or I was, um, heavily chastised in 2008 when the market fell rapidly and I learned a great deal uh, about how a seemingly great business can, can have um, flaws in its foundations um, and that's, that, that's an experience that I've taken forward in the next 10 years and um, fast forwarding to the last four I've been acting as an advisor to recruitment companies um, I find myself on the board of 14 recruitment companies in Australia, New Zealand and Singapore I spent a lot of time in the UK too um, and that's been a privilege because you find yourself on the inside of other people's companies and you learn as much as you contribute. And, and that brings us up to now. And we're, uh, we're hoping between us to bring a lot of that joint experience to this series in the UK in November. Fantastic. That's great. So, I mean, you guys are fortunate enough to be traveling all over the world just now delivering the Savage, the, the sprint events. Um, why are you bringing it to the UK? Well, first of all, um, if Chris, if just allow me to, to jump in here. We created this because of, of the, the, what we saw was the rapid evolution in the recruitment industry. Now, that's not exactly a you know, very enlightening thing to say. Everyone knows the recruitment's changing. Mm -hmm. But what people may not be as aware of is the amount of danger that they're in. I see a lot of recruiters who I would describe as yesterday's heroes. They build a lot in the past. They, they, they were on top of their game in the past, but slowly they're becoming less effective because they are clinging only to the tactics of the past. Now, there are a lot of things from the past that we must continue, mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of things we have to change. Of course, they're to do with technology, but they also to do with understanding changing candidate behavior and clients' expectations. So we see a lot of um, recruiters declining in effectiveness and a lot of managers and owners of recruitment companies are responding in entirely the wrong way what a lot of them are doing and i see this in the uk a lot i was there in april i spoke to i think it was close to a thousand owners of recruitment companies in five days at a series of events thousands of i was going to say thousands of beers but lots of beers <laughs> lots of coffees lots of covers lots of it probably was lots of conversations and you know, there's a good percentage who are responding to this changing environment by getting their people to do more of the behaviors that they shouldn't be doing at all. Mm. Um, and, and so people are working harder and harder for less return. So 
we put this together to say, look, this is the this is you know, predicting the future is a, is, is, a, is a fool's game. I I do it you know all the time, and, and I only tend to emphasise the ones that come true. But we we do believe that in the future of the future of the recruitment industry, the agency recruitment industry is is fabulous. I'm investing in recruitment companies. That's how much I believe in it. But we also believe that a big percentage of our industry will not survive. So it's going to be success of a fewer group. And we've designed this as a roadmap. And that's how we describe it. And that's how we present it to, to make sure you end up in that peak group. And I think in the talk, I say 20% are going to be in that peak group. I may even say 10%. I don't really know. But a yep. small fraction will thrive. And they'll make more money, have more fun than ever before, Cameron. Mm -hmm. um, but then, of course, there's that other group who won't have either of those things. So it, it, our, our session sprint is about individual evolution. And it's very practical. You know, we, we say, and we haven't counted it, but we say with some confidence, you'll go away with 100 ideas, tactics, and strategies that you can employ immediately in, into your work pattern. That, that's okay. the, that's the, it's a half day, so there's a lot of time to cover that stuff. Yep. Awesome. And then on the on the day itself as well, then, so we're going to discuss in detail about um, what a future fit recruiter is. So can you give us a bit of an overview on that and, and how um, people be, would be able to become a future fit recruiter? Greg, let me just make a comment, if I may, uh, just to set the scene and then I'll hand back to you. You know, we called it Sprint uh, uh, for a number of re reasons. But one of the things we like about the title sprint for the future fit recruiter is mm -hmm. is like any great sprinter you have to have two things at play to really be a, a a champion sprinter you need to have the desire or the hunger the mm -hmm. macro ambition to be the very best you can be and then you've got to have a lot of technical skill for every step along the journey the the detailed technical skill on how you can leverage your skills and be the best you can be. So as we start talking you through now, the six pillars of the Future Fit Recruiter that we call Savage Sprint, a lot of my content is more the macro, the, okay. the ambition, the bigger picture, um, uh, um, motivational, inspirational tips and tactics to help uh, recruiters really have the, the hunger and desire to stay in the game, to stay in the business for as long as they want to, and to achieve far more than they ever achieved possible. And Greg takes them into a lot of very detailed technical um, and, um, ideas on how to actually fine, fine tune and develop your skills to build more today. So when we look at Sprint, Greg, take us through three of the pillars of Sprint as an overview. Yeah, I will do. Chris, I just thought it'd be a good idea if we did them one by one. So I'll do one, you do one, I'll do one, you do one. Okay, we'll do it that way to break up the um, break up the thing. Now, I want to tell the guys that um, we delivered this across Australia and New Zealand in nine cities, and we had fifteen hundred recruiters turn up uh, across those events. And the feedback, gratifyingly, was was extremely positive. Yep. And we're presenting we're presenting it next month in uh, South Africa as well. So by the time we get to the UK. I'm hoping Chris will know his 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 lines by then okay. because you know he will have had 50. You know, there's a good chance he'll remember what to say. <laughs> but it's broken it's broken into six pillars that we call. Yep. And the first one they're not in this order, um, but this is a flavour. The first one that I'm going to talk about is sourcing. So we say that future fit recruiter, notwithstanding the effect that artificial intelligence might have on everything that we're saying, and we touch on that and we we warn people about what they need to do. Um, and uh, we say that a, a future fit recruiter is going to be an expert in sourcing, that's identifying candidates, but also, and this is the key part, an expert at seduction, yep. which is a word I use purposely because I think as, as things like technology, artificial intelligence, algorithms make it easier to find people on the internet, mm -hmm. which, which is and which they will and become more so. The real competitive advantage in recruitment is on the seduction, the approaching of people, which, by the way, recruiters are hopeless at. I mean, I, I, I get headhunted for recruitment jobs because I'm connected to so many recruiters on LinkedIn. I get headhunted every week. I get headhunted in jobs in other countries for £5,000 a year or whatever because they haven't given any thought to the approach. It's a spam approach. And we say you've got to be uh, very good at finding people, but you've got to be sophisticated in the art of outreach 
and bring them into the net, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We also do go into a lot of uh, detail on sourcing tools. We, we, we talk about tactics to use Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn in a fresh way. And they're very easily used hacks. We go back to some so-called old, old school skills like phone sourcing, which uh, mm -hmm. is a lost art and which I believe is a missed opportunity for many people. And, and it's a big part of the event, uh, this sourcing and seduction, because you know our, our view is that the future of recruitment is about access to candidates, yep. right? So therefore, while we do talk a lot about your client relationships, we, we, we put a big section into how are you gonna get candidates that clients will pay you big fees for? Yep. So that's the first one. Chris, what's the one you're gonna talk a lot about? I think a lot of that sourcing and seduction uh, um, uh, pillar is about being brilliant at being a skills hunter. But the modern day recruiter, the future fit recruiter has to be much more than that. You also have to be a talent and client magnets. Candidates have to be able to find you. And that's where the P comes in, promoter. The future fit recruiter needs to be outstanding at promoting their brand. So mm -hmm. this part of our sprint workshop looks at how do you go and promote your brand in the modern world. We look in detail at how to promote your brand offline. And a big part of our uh, uh, content there is around being brilliant at candidate care. And I know as someone who in my last role had a recruitment budget of close to $5 million, um, how dissatisfied many of the people we hired through recruiters were with the level of candidate care and, our, and, and customer service excellence or candidate service excellence that they received from 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 their recruitment agency so that's low-hanging fruit and we'll talk about building your your brand offline but then a big part of the section is how to build your brand online um it, you've got to remember that building your brand online is not a project it's not a fad it's not just something for the to-do list it needs to become embedded in your DNA as a modern day recruiter. And as we look at building your, your, your brand online, we talk about the need to take a long-term strategy. If you're gonna build that brand online, you've gotta take a longer term view. You need to develop a strategy with KPIs, and you then need to integrate the, like, the right mix of channels to really broadcast and build your brand in the right way. It might include Twitter, it might include blogging, it certainly like, uh, likely to include LinkedIn as a distribution channel. Greg, I yep. know, has become very um, uh, very much a fan of, of, of how to use Instagram in the right way for business. So we go into quite a lot of detail about how to build that strategy. And Greg particularly shares some of his ideas on how to build and how to use Twitter and how to use blogging, which he has done very successfully in his career. Greg, give us another pillar. Yeah, so just picking up Chris's point, I think there's a lot of recruiters who put uh, banding into the this is too wanky basket, or maybe they put it into this is too hard basket, and we make a big push to say, you've got to smarten up. This is one of those areas where you need to reinvent yourself, where you need to smash the, the paradigms of the past, mm -hmm. because old school selling is now marketing as well as selling and requires inbound marketing and that's going to happen by branding and content and all those things which by the way firefish are very good at as an organization as we know but um, you know companies need to do this you know if I, one of the things i advise recruiters is who often say you know i want to join a new company what should i be looking for i say they should look for a company that's modern in its marketing and it's and it's branding so that you as an individual can build your brand within that context. So yeah. critically important. The other thing we, we talk about, which is the theme of, of, of the event really, but is the importance of reinvention, mm -hmm. reinventing yourself. You know, I like to say, and I think I do say, don't focus so much competing with the other recruitment agencies. Don't focus so much, I mean, you, you will compete with them. You'll compete with your clients ironically, and you may compete with the other guys in the room, but the real person you're competing with is yourself. Are you a better recruiter than you were yesterday? Do you have different skills? Because the, the industry is changing so fast, the available technologies are changing so fast, the environment's changing so fast that if you enter 2018 with the same skills that you entered in 2017, you are immediately putting yourself behind the smarter 
group. And we, and we break that down and we say you need to reinvent the way you find candidates. You cannot do it only the way you've done it in the past. Some of the things like job boards and LinkedIn will continue to work, but that's not differentiated. Everyone's, I'm sitting here and I've got, I can put an ad on a job board in England. I can go on LinkedIn and find people in England. So what advantage have you in England got over me? Virtually nothing unless you build tactics and strategies to tap into people that I can't. And we say you need to reinvent the way you business develop with clients and you build relationships with clients. We talk about engagement with clients in a different way. We even reinvent the definition of selling in the industry. And we also spend a bit of time talking about how you've got to spend time on different things to what you traditionally have. I mean, some of the things are the same, obviously, but many, many have changed. And we talk about changing your whole attitude to the business you accept. We talk about exclusivity. We talk about um, pushing back against the commoditization of recruitment, which will truly fuck you up without any question. Um, if you want to be poor and unhappy, become a transactional commoditized recruiter because you will be hammered by a machine or by a guy in Manila who'll do the job for one tenth that you will do it for. Yeah. So we cannot go down that route. We can't compete on price and speed. I mean, we've got to be cost effective and we've got to be urgent, but they mustn't be our competitive advantage. Our competitive advantage is access to candidates that others can't find. So that's that's the reinvention section. And then Chris comes in and talks about, what do you talk about, Chris? I don't usually listen to that part. Networking, Greg. I think, Networking, Greg. I think one of the ways that we've got to reinvent is to keep our networks fresh. You know you're getting stale when your network is aging and you're not adding new people to your networking. So we have a, a really good session on how to network in the modern world. And for many people, networking is a bit of a dirty word. They think it's about going to cocktail parties, schmoozing and handing out business cards. Well, it's not. It's much more than that. There's a very, very simple, proven strategy on how to build a network that will make a massive difference in your ability to find clients, to attract candidates, but also to become uh, something you'll touch on later, Greg, a key person of influence in your industry, to build your, your influence and your impact in, in, in your areas of recruitment. So when we look at networking, you know, our, our overall sort of um, hypothesis is that if you can develop relationships, everything and anything is possible. And developing relationships, I found in all the many years that I've worked with recruiters, hasn't been front of mind for many recruiters. They are transactional. They're all over you when they've got a candidate. They're all over you when you've got a job. But in that period in between, they disappear. And networking is about a number of things, seven pillars to networking that include things like giving time. Time is at the absolute core of networking, and we explain why. It's about building what Greg and I call goodwill equity. How through the time you spend with individuals, new individuals, your existing network, you're building, you're doing favors, you're introducing people, you're putting it out there and not expecting anything back in return. You're building goodwill equity. You don't make friends in a crisis or when you're in trouble. You make those friends and that goodwill equity before you need help. So we go through the seven key steps in building a powerful network. And frankly, when, excuse me, when I think about my career and as I've moved from one role to another, it's been my database, my network, that has been the most powerful thing that I've taken with me. Now, your network is not your LinkedIn contacts. Your network is that smaller group of people that if you bumped into them at the airport, you'd know their name, you'd greet them warmly, and there would be some sort of connection of value between you. And we'll, we'll take you through how to build that network. And Greg particularly takes you through six steps on how to leverage LinkedIn in a much more powerful way to build a network that can really add value to your billing today and tomorrow. Greg? Yeah, so uh, Cameron, we've covered just briefly there four of the pillars. I've got one more and Chris has got one more there. Sure. The one I then talk about is influencing skills. Now, this is as old as um, when I got into recruitment in January 1980, which I know is very hard for people to believe because I can see on the screen how young I'm looking. But it was January 1980 where there was no, let, let alone internet, there was no fax machines. And so the real differentiator in recruitment was your influencing skills. Mm -hmm. And 
as much as you, Cameron, know that I'm a proponent of digital, I'm a proponent of technology, I'm an early adopter, I know quite a bit about it, um, and, and certainly social media is something I'm very familiar with, despite my generation. Yep. It's true that digital has been a twin-edged sword or a two-edged sword for our industry. It's dumbed the industry down because so many recruiters hide behind digital. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and everything's done by, and, and so many clients have driven the industry, ironically, towards digital communication, which means that the opportunity to influence, to exercise the craft of recruitment has been lost. And one of our biggest premises is, if you think about the influence of artificial intelligence, if you think about the, the parts of the job that is likely to take away, mm -hmm. which will potentially include sourcing, it'll, it'll certainly include matching, it might even include early engagement with chat box and other such technologies. Yep. If you if you look ahead a year or two and you think what's going to be left of the recruiter job, the part that's going to be left is the influencing part. The, 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 the crafting a story to convince somebody that this job is right for them. And when I say crafting a story, I don't mean a false story. I mean a, a compelling story. That's true. Mm -hmm. And so influencing skills. Okay. And what we, you know, that's a whole topic in itself. But what we talk about on the day in relation to that are, are uh, some basic skills around discriminating with candidates. And yes, I use the discrimination word, and of course I don't mean that in any ridiculous sense like race or gender or anything like that. I mean working out which candidates will get job offers and accept them because the future of recruitment for us is thousands of counter offers as talent shortages and skills shortages in key areas bite. So understanding your control and management of the candidate process and qualifying job orders and working exclusive, exclusively on job orders. These are key things which, frankly, I was taught in the 80s and honed in the 90s and has been lost in the, in the noughties. And now we have a whole generation of recruiters who don't even understand what I'm talking about. And the problem there is we've got recruiters now who are facing things like like counter offers and they don't know how to deal with them because they've never been taught because they've only ever dealt with their candidates on email yeah. <laughs> and they've never met their candidates. And that again is, 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 is dumbing recruitment down. It's missing the opportunity to, to influence the outcome of those moments of truth. I didn't invent the phrase moments of truth. That is invented by a much smarter person than me, but I relate it now to recruitment, those moments of truth, the many of them in recruitment, where you can influence the outcome. And some of them are small, like, will this candidate be considered for this job? And some of them are big, like, will this client give us this contract or will this candidate accept this job? But they all involve human influencing skills, yep. which is lacking in our industry. So there's a, there's a powerful section on that. Um, and actually, it's gone down. Most of Chris's stuff, and one of the ironies is I invited Chris to come and do this series with me, thinking he would tag along. They liked him more than me. It's really <laughs> irritating. Um, but they did like that one section on influencing because it just reminded people that's what we're here for. That's the value. That's what we earn our fee for. Chris. So we've covered five of the six pillars of the future fit recruiter. We've looked at sourcer or seducing, that's on promoter, reinventor, influencer, and networker. And the final pillar that we look at is what we call taskmaster. And this is a short, sharp session on basically how to be more efficient and effective every single day in the way that we come to work, how we focus on our priorities and how we get more done. You know, the whole evolution of social media, and we talk a lot about how to leverage social to become a skills hunter, to become a talent magnet, to build your brand and be a promoter. It, our lives are getting busier and busier, and a future fit recruiter has to be more efficient, more effective. So we take um, uh, uh, everyone through the 10 key steps in building and driving your efficiency and your effectiveness. We look at some, some very simple techniques that some people use, but we sharpen it in terms of how to prioritize what you do every day. And people say, well, that's very simple. I say it might be, but we take you through some techniques on getting better at not only prioritizing very carefully how you're going to attack the day, but thinking about how much time you're going to spend against each of those priorities. And then we talk about the most critical tip of all, which is how to stick to your priorities. Obviously, as the day evolves, 
other matters come up, urgent things evolve, but therefore yep. two or three times a day you need to reprioritize. And Greg takes us through some brilliant productivity hacks, some simple ideas that you can bring into your business leveraging technology to be more efficient and effective. So Cameron, that's really it. They're, they're the six pillars of the future fit recruiter. It, 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 there are far more than 100 tips, tools, and tactics, um, and everyone comes away with plenty of ammunition they can use immediately to build more today, most importantly, to build more tomorrow, and to stay relevant in recruitment for as long as they want to be in the recruitment industry. Brilliant. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, see, in the UK at the moment, I've got a you know, a lot of uh, a decent sized network of, of agency recruiters based in the UK. And some of them have got absolutely fantastic personal brands. Um, they're really starting to, to think about how to grow these. Chris, see to future proof yourself as a recruiter, how important do you think personal brand is? Well, personal branding is absolutely non-negotiable. It's critical, not only okay. in this industry, but in most industries now. I just spent the last week at the Cannes Creativity Festival in the south of France, which in the advertising and marketing and communications industry is like our Oscars. And okay. you know, listening to speakers uh, talk, you know, they, the, the constant theme was personal branding is an absolute critical pillar of modern day business. And for recruitment, Absolutely. It is about thinking about your personal brand. And we go through the four pillars of what makes up brand you. Every one of us is a brand at work. When I mention your name and you're not in the room, it creates a feeling inside the people in that room. Just like when I say to you now, you'll get a feeling when I say these brands, Donald Trump, David Beckham, right? You know, it creates a feeling, good, bad, indifferent, that's a brand. And we're brands. And we look at the four pillars of, of our personal brands. And, you know, are we delivering outcomes? Are we expert in something? Do we have a point of view of the future? And are we considered by our colleagues as being supportive and collegial? And we look at what each of these four pieces of the brand you pizza mean. You need to make sure your brand's strong before you start trying to build that brand externally. We talked then about how to go about and build your profile. And a lot of, of, of building one's brand profile today is through developing engaging and relevant content, content that mm -hmm. then is distributed through the various channels that, that we, we've touched on already and, and we'll touch on uh, um, in more detail. It is very much about storytelling around not only your brand, but becoming brilliant at storytelling in the way that you seduce candidates to roles, yep. in the way you tell stories to convince clients that candidates are right or convince clients to give you the next assignment. So storytelling is a critical part of personal branding uh, in, in the modern world. We look at it offline, we look at it online. And at the end of the day, what we want recruiters to become is what we call trusted authorities, trusted mm -hmm. authorities about their area, their specialization, their sector in the recruitment industry. So that when a client or a candidate comes into contact with you, the recruiter, they've already heard about you. They've already got mm -hmm. an impression about you. You're already an existing brand that has some sort of meaning for them. And if you can build that kind of brand awareness and personal branding, your power, your influence, your ability to differentiate, your success will accelerate more than you, you, than you could ever have imagined. Uh, so we're, we're very passionate about building personal brand. Yeah, I think that's absolutely brilliant. I mean, you want to become the go-to person in your niche, don't you? If you can become that person, absolutely. then ever, you just have so many more warm conversations. Brilliant. Right. Um, it's obviously a very, very competitive market at the moment um, on, on, on globally uh, in recruitment. But I mean, how, how do we make sure that we're, we can stay ahead of the competition if you're a recruiter? Well, um, it starts with a, with a, uh, um, a state of mind. Mm -hmm. And that state of mind is, even if you're doing well now, and look, uh, there's a lot of people doing well. There's a lot of companies doing well. And unfortunately, success is kind of seductive because it it, 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 it tricks us into thinking there's no need to change. Yeah. And I'm sure you know, I'm sure we can all talk about many, many companies and industries and taxi companies and uh, 
hotels and music and all those industries that were very comfortable and top of the heap and, and, and then found that um, the carpenters were whipped away from under them, mm. he said with a very mixed metaphor there. Um, but that, that is true. So I think it's a state of mind, first of all, and that state of mind is, I like to, the an analogy I use is a recruiter should live on the edge. I like the word edge because the, the word edge means sharp. It means you've got to be sharp. It means you've got to be edgy. It means you've got to be pushing the envelope. And also, if you think of the metaphor, if you literally lived on the edge of a cliff, you would be alert, you would be nimble, you would be on the ball, you would not be dozing off, right? And yeah. that is how recruiters need to think. And of course, that plays into this whole four-hour seminar where what we're talking about is upskilling, reinventing, throwing out what doesn't work anymore, replacing it with new things, and honing the skills that have always worked but need to be um, burnished and improved. So it's really a state of mind. It's, it's about challenging yourself. Um, Chris, I stole this phrase from Chris, and I hope I'm not stealing it from him for tonight, but he talks about a nano degree. And what he means is, you know, we might all have our qualifications and we're not going to university, but we all should have some little thing that we're working on. Now, mine, I've got to give a talk two weeks' time down in Melbourne about artificial intelligence and how it, fits, it affects recruitment. I don't really know very much about that, or I didn't a month ago. But I do now because I took a little nano degree in it. I, 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 I made myself read blogs. I, I called people I knew who knew something about this. I listened to webinars and, and I thought about it and I percolated it. And now I feel I'm no expert, but I've got a point of view that's probably quite valid. A month ago, I would have been really winging it. So I did a little nano degree in it. And I think we should always be working on a nano degree that's going to help our business, whatever it might be. It might be as simple as I'm going to try and sell exclusivity. I'm going to learn how to use um, Facebook to search for candidates better than little nano degrees is the attitude. Most recruiters are completely, um, uh, this, that concept's alien to them because they've had success. We know how to do it. It's built into our psyche. We're good recruiters. So we're, we're not wanting to upskill. That's got to be turned on its head. We've got to crack everything and build again. Chris. Yeah, I think that's right, that's right, Greg. I mean, you talk about how to stay ahead of your competition. And in fact, I think the, the biggest competitor we've got to staying ahead and to staying relevant is ourselves. And you have to have a, a reasonable degree of paranoia to, I think, stay current, stay relevant, stay value adding in the recruitment industry. Um, in the most dangerous thing, as Greg said, is, is a good last result. You're only as good as your next result. So yeah. one tip that we talk about uh, um, at Savage Sprint is something that Edward de Bono, the great thinker, um, shared, shared with me a couple of years ago where he said, I've invented a word for today, a word that doesn't exist, a word that we need to use every single day if we are to stay ahead of our competition. And that word is EBNE, E-B-N-E. -E. Excellent, but not enough. EBNE, excellent, but not enough. So when you hit your billings for the week, it's Ebna. Celebrate for a minute, but it's excellent, but it's not enough. How can we do 15% more next week? When you add some innovation, that's Ebna. It's excellent, but not enough. And I think having, not I think, I know, having a philosophy of Ebna, where you are constantly dissatisfied with how you're doing today, where you keep thinking about what you need to do next, where you work on yourself as a project, where you work on yourself harder than you work on your job. This is critical to, 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 to doing what Greg just said, you know, the nano degree that he did a couple of weeks ago to stay one step ahead in terms of um, AI. That's exactly what we're talking about. You need always to know 5% more than anybody else in the room about the area that you're supposed to be expert in. And if you know 5% more than anybody else in the room, in the area that you're supposed to be expert in, you're gonna stay ahead. You're gonna stay ahead of your competition. You're gonna stay ahead of your clients and ahead of your candidates. So th there's some ideas. We go through a lot of ideas in this particular section um, in the Savage Sprint workshop. So we've actually got a couple of questions, guys, that are on to do with what we were speaking, well, what you guys were covering off a moment ago. So one's to do with personal brand. So uh, Mark Hopkins is asking, um, should you overlap personal brand with company brand? Yes, I'll take that if I may, because it's a great question and a lot of people struggle with it. Think of it like this. You've got great rugby players in a rugby team or 
football players in a, in a soccer team. And they're individuals. They've got their own skills, their own talent, their own brand, their own way of playing. Mm -hmm. But for success to happen for them and for the team, they've got to fit in with the strategy of the team, right? So the team produces uh, the coach and the team produces, the, pays their wages, gives them the stadium, gives them the training, gives them salaries, uh, and gives them a strategy on the day. And the, all the players are playing towards that strategy, the brand of football that we play. Yep. On the day, the individual might do their own thing within that context. Now, it's a kind of a tortured analogy. I'll give you that. But what you really want in recruitment is a company that is providing an infrastructure of branding, which will come via content and social media and automated marketing, PR and a wide range of things. And then they need to train recruiters to build their brands within that context. And then you get that amplification, right? So think of it like this. You've got a recruitment company of 50 people, let's say. The company puts out material and content and then the recruiters amplify it by sharing it through their networks and engaging. It's so powerful. Yep. And so, yes, an individual will build their brand within the context of the company brand, but at the very end of the day, the individual's brand does belong to them. So the analogy, you transfer the footballer from team A to team B, he then adopts the brand of the other organization, taking his brand with him. Okay, right. so that's how it should work. I hope that makes sense to people. Excellent. And then um, on the AI side of things, um, Martin McDevitt asked, um, do you think AI will be the death of recruitment? He personally doesn't think so, but he'd be keen to get your views on that. Well, Martin's 100% correct. It's not the death of recruitment, but what it will do, in my view, we, when we talk about the future, you know, we all step on a very slippery slope. But um, I, I think that AI, for the foreseeable future, I mean, who knows what will happen in 50 years, but for the foreseeable future, as long as most of us have to worry, it will take significant chunks of the recruiter's job that are currently very time consuming, but um, mostly drudgery. Okay, so matching. So for example, I know I've got a client in the UK, I went to go and see them, they're using a little tool called Pocket Recruiter. It plugs into their um, ATS, and it has had a, a massive impact on searching that ATS and coming up with shortlists that would take a recruiter a full day. It did it in 10 minutes. What's more, it found previously unfound candidates that the human beings could not find with Boolean search, et cetera, et cetera. It found these candidates. As a result, the, this is the, that's cool. But the coolest part is over a period of six months when they looked at it, they found that their recruiters were spending more time on the phone, mm -hmm. spending more time interviewing candidates, spending more time talking to candidates. Well, I guess that's on the phone. But also, here's the kicker getting more exclusive jobs because the clients were, were happy with the quality of the shortlist. So the recruiter's job wasn't replaced. It just allowed, what would I, the way we've got to think about artificial intelligence is that we should embrace it, we should get it to take away all our hack work, and then we should become experts at doing the things that AI can't do. Yeah. And the day that AI can convince a candidate to take a job subject to a counter offer, well, that's the day we've got to worry. But I don't think it's coming anytime soon. No, no, brilliant. Um, just one. Yeah? Sorry, yeah. Man, I just want to jump in, if I may, because I do see there's another comment there from Elizabeth, which I'd like to address, if I may, where she, she asks uh, whether celebrating the wins keeps staff engaged and pays respect to their upskilling efforts. Isn't the attitude of being constantly dissatisfied a manifestation of nothing is good enough? So why should I continue to strive? So she's concerned that that could be a bit negative and a bit demotivating. And I'd like to make a couple of comments, which is I think okay. it's very important to celebrate the excellence. So in Ebna, it's excellent. Celebration, high fives, out for a drink, gift, spa, whatever it is involved. And then it's mm -hmm. a case of saying, but how do we improve on that? And I think the lesson I learned was for many years, my biggest client was Microsoft. And this was in the 90s when Microsoft was the biggest company in the world. And you would do a launch for Microsoft and you'd get together with them the next day. And you, you had an hour meeting. And for seven minutes, we would celebrate about how great it was and we'd tell stories. But then for 53 minutes, we'd talk about how could we have improved it next time? How could we be more efficient, have got more value, have delivered a better result? So I think it is just a mindset. And Greg and I do like our sporting analogies because they are often so relevant to business. But we talk about high performance. And if you look at a high performing team, there's no higher performing sports team in the world. 
as the British Lions found out this weekend, the Blacks. And when you watch the All Blacks play, as Greg and I have done many times, and we see them beat the Wallabies by 20 points, and we stay around afterwards to have a cup of coffee and, and say goodbye to our friends, and 20 minutes after the game's finished, the All Blacks run back out onto the field, and they practice some moves that they didn't feel that they executed well enough. That's high performance. So they would have celebrated for 20 minutes in the change room, and then they've gone back out to do the extra mile, and it's lonely on the extra mile. There are not many people there to work on how to improve for the next time. So we're very big on celebrating, rewarding, acknowledging, but always thinking about, well, what could we do next to improve that? That is critical in modern-day business, particularly during fast-changing times. Sorry, Cameron, back to you. No, brilliant. Thanks very much for addressing that. Um, Chris, what should an agency owner do to enable their teams to become future fit? Well, first of all, it is always about hiring the very, very best talent. Uh, I remember Shelley Lazarus, who was the chairman of Ogilvy, saying to us, you know, it's the people with the best people who always win, always. So really, really working on hiring the right people, people with high change intelligence, people who want to be high performers. Uh, it, it, it's challenging for our clients, for your clients, recruitment uh, industry clients, to find that great talent. You've got to find that great talent for yourself. Intense training, intense on-the-job training, structured training, um, uh, uh, attending training like Savage Sprint and other training that's available. A commitment to training is critical to keep an organization future fit. The, the organizations mm -hmm. that are future fit now are bringing in people to talk about AI and the speech that Greg did a couple of weeks ago. That organization is now ahead of most of its competitors <laughs> thinking about, about um, what's coming up. It's about coaching in real time giving feedback yep. in real yep. time on the job to your staff. It's about self-disruption. And that's a lot of the content, the ideas that Greg talks about, that I talk about, is about changing the routine on how you do things. It's about innovation. Now, innovation is a big word. It's a, it's a, I don't like it. What does it mean? It's a threatening word. It feels to me like, like a New York City. You know, a New York City is very big and intimidating until you break New York City down into villages. And you navigate your day in New York by saying, I'm in Soho in the morning, and then I'm going to Greenwich Village, I've got lunch in Chelsea, and then I'm going Midtown, and then I'm going wherever. That's the same with innovation. Innovation is just about making small steps of progress consistently, month in, month out. Small steps of progress in the way you source clients, in the way you work on your seduction skills, in the way you build your brand, in the way you structure your pricing, in the way you leverage technology to be more productive. These are all ways that you disrupt yourself. And then another way to be really future fit is, is to embrace technology. Uh, Greg and I both love the concept of having what we call reverse mentors, and that's making sure you've got a 15-year-old telling you on the, about the technology that they're using, how they're using it. When they turn 16, you have to fire them because it's the 13, 14 year olds and 15 year olds who are really using the latest in technology. And finally, to really have a future fit recruitment agency and, and team, you need to use KPIs in a new way. Use your KPIs to reflect new priorities in the recruitment industry. Greg, give me some flavor on how you'd use KPIs today to really get peak performance out of an agency. So that, that's, a, that's a big topic. I mean, I think KPIs are, are uh, so, so let, me, let me show my hand. I, I believe in KPIs. I believe you can't manage what you don't measure. I think the problem with KPIs is they've been appallingly delivered and they haven't been updated. And, the, and, and very rarely is the recruiter included in setting the KPI. And I think we should just forget about the word KPI, but talk about a, uh, um, a dashboard of activity like, that are proven to lead to success. And yeah. I think you know, KPIs have got to, uh, or, or, or activities have, have got to be reinvented. Some of them remain the same, but certainly they need to align more with the branding. Um, mm -hmm. And by the way, we just had a question there, which will tie into this, where somebody said, um, let me see, Julie it was, who said, um, shouldn't we just give the recruiters a marketing executive so they don't have to do that side of things and they can get on with the recruiting? Julie, recruitment is marketing. Recruitment is marketing. You do need a marketing executive, a digital marketing person, 
to work with your company brand. But recruitment is part, sorry, marketing is part of the DNA of a recruiter now. You need to build your personal brand because you don't own the company brand, right? When you leave this employer and go somewhere else, unless you steal a computer, you take nothing with you apart from your brand and your reputation, So they are, which are linked. So they are the two things you need to build. So no, yes, so yes and no. Yes, you need a marketing executive. And you need a team. In fact, I say if a recruitment company's got six staff, their seven staff member needs to be a digital marketing person. And I truly believe that because that's going to provide much more value than a seventh recruiter. Um, but each recruiter must take on responsibility for building their personal brand for the way Chris describes. Going back to activities, we've got to have, have activities that measure social interaction, but more importantly, me measure outcomes from social. And if somebody's really interested in this topic, um, go to my blog. This is a full blog. They're called KPIs from crap to credible is the title of the blog. And there I lay out a series of new measurements that people should use too long for today. Brilliant. Fantastic. Brilliant. Fantastic. And then um, the impact of the impact. Um, not becoming a future fit recruiter. What's the impact? Yeah, yeah what's the impact? It's a slow, painful death. Commercial debt. And it'll come like this. Yep. You'll be living off the scraps, right? You, 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 you'll, you'll be chomping at the margins. You, you'll be accepting uh, the worst business. Your job satisfaction will drop. Your billings will drop. Your fees will drop. And then you'll get dropped. That's the story. That's the end of that story. Seriously. It may not happen in a week. It's happening to some people right now. Uh, but it may not happen in a week, may not happen in a month, but it will happen over the next 24 months. Uh, I, I reckon most people who don't start to show the qualities of a future fit recruiter as we describe them, and, and others, I'm sure we haven't got 100% right, we are trying to predict uh, things to a certain degree. I think those people will not, well, they certainly won't thrive. They may live hand to mouth for a few more years. Eventually, like someone hanging onto a cliff state face, they will drop out of sight but having said that cameron i think i think the main message that greg and i get across in savage sprint is our high degree of optimism about the recruitment industry so if if recruiters managers owners and rock face recruiters are adopting the sort of tactics tips and tools that we outline if they have that change intelligence if they accept that what got them here to get them there in terms of their career you know frankly conditions are perfect in the recruitment industry for future fit recruiters to absolutely thrive so our session you know it, it, we start off by saying that that you know half the industry i think greg you predict half the industry you know won't be around doing business in five years time but in the other half there's a big percentage that will be having um the the, the golden age of recruitment the best time that, 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 that they um, could possibly have so we're very optimistic about where this industry is at and the opportunity for a vibrant future. Fantastic. Yes, totally agree. Uh, Cameron, I'll just pick up a question if you like, because I also, know we're running out of time. Um, to Gillian, I'm a sole recruiter, uh, no staff. Should I outsource social media? Great, great, great question, Gillian. Um, yes and no. So yes, you should for your organization. Your company will have a name. It'll have a website. It'll have a brand. You, you, you will probably find somebody who can help you on content and distribution of content and maybe even on engagement, and, and that should be good. But you yourself, Gillian, even if your company name is Gillian Barber, you yourself should adopt a personal branding strategy, um, which only need take up 20, 30 minutes of your day where you are building your brand in conjunction with your company brand, even if the name is the same, okay? Because one day you might sell Gillian Barber Associates, but you won't sell yourself. I see we've lost Chris. This is typical of him. He always leaves when the hard work has yet to be done. <laughs> uh, I'm here. It's <laughs> going to oh, he's here, but we can't see your face. I think you're well, probably a highlight of the time. <laughs> so um, we are obviously um, Farfish are fortunate enough to be um, bringing both of you guys or you guys are coming over to, to talk at an event in the UK in November um, you can get tickets on the call to action just below below our picture here but um, what why should recruiters come come to the event what can they expect well 
Mm. Some That's people have said it's quite, it's yeah. quite entertaining because because Chris spends a, quite a big proportion of the morning taking the mickey out of me, which I think is hurtful and unfair. But the real reason they should come is what we've been talking about today. I'm not going to be foolish enough to suggest you're going to leave that session equipped with everything you need. That's not true. But what it will do, and what it's proven to do, the feedback we've had, I mean, we did this, as I said, with 1,500 recruiters in Australia. They were surveyed. Recruiters in Australia are as demanding and as um, uh, critical as anywhere else in the world. And we got an 80% valuation of excellence and 80% said they learned a huge amount and I think what we hope to do is leave people with yes some tactics and ideas that they can use the next week but the motivation to rethink the way they approach their job and and, and so that's why I think people should come I mean I truly believe that it's a valuable morning um, it'll be four hours packed with information. I, mean, I, hope, I hope this session has given people some sort of flavour of, of, of what the day will be like. Fantastic. That's great. Guys, I think we're um, coming up to the, the end of our time. Um, I just want to take an opportunity to thank you both very, very much for joining us and um, thank everyone that, that's um, got involved in the live chat today as well. It's been absolutely fantastic having you all on. If you guys would like the opportunity to meet Greg and Chris face to face, then um, click on the, the uh, picket button below and you can come to the event in Glasgow in November and meet the guys and um, as they said, they'll be elaborating on these points and you'll get loads of value to take away and start to implement into your own businesses. Gents. Cameron, if I could just jump in on the plug. Um, obviously, we want you to come to Glasgow. I've spoken in Glasgow before for Firefish. It was fantastic. I love the city, by the way. I didn't know much about it. It came away a bit of a fan. Um, we had 100 recruiters that day and um, I, would, I would love to see you there. This is all new material. But also, if you're not from Scotland or Glasgow, that northern region of England, um, we're also in Manchester. We're also in London. It's on the REC website. And if you happen to be in South Africa, we're in Cape Town and Johannesburg <laughs> as well. <laughs> but but main thing is get to Scotland. We, we really, you know, People in Scotland said to me, hardly anyone comes and speaks in Scotland from the recruitment industry. Well, we're coming all the way from Australia. Can't be a bigger effort than that. So please come and see us there. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks again. Cheers, Chris. Thank Cheers, Greg. You. All the best. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Are we still live, mate?